third example that I want to talk about in the media. Uh, this comes from Stuff, our good friends at Stuff, and Stuff Circuit, as it's called, which is funded, of course, by you, the taxpayer. And my, my old mate, Paula Penfold, she who made the Fire and Fury documentary and a journalist called Louisa Cleave. They have published a piece this weekend about a group called the Proud Boys. They say there is a group called the New Zealand Proud Boys, and the headline of this story says, the New Zealand Proud Boys say they're just friends, but the truth is more disturbing. Something more disturbing than being friends. And very much like the incel thing, they say this is an undercover investigation. They were approached, they say, by sources too afraid to say who they were, to say you should have a look at this group, the Proud Boys. Now, the Proud Boys in the United States have been designated a terrorist group. And therefore, the Proud Boys in the States here are also designated a terrorist group. But what doesn't become clear in the hundreds of words written by Paula Penfold as she clutches her pearls is whether or not there actually are any Proud Boys in New Zealand. Now, they didn't go undercover. They trolled the internet, basically. They trolled the internet and the internet accounts of a whole lot of New Zealanders who seemed to be, to be honest, slightly dicky guys who got together, had, had beers and talked rubbish. Uh, once again, none of these people have done anything criminal. None of these people uh, seem to be under investigation by uh, any um, organized, law organisations. But Stuff Circuit, apparently got given, um, they say, a group of more than a dozen known followers, there are possibly more, was at the height of its activities at the time violent threats were made and in recent times those involved have sought to scrub their social media of incriminating evidence. Well, given no one's charged, how incriminating can it be? But researchers of the far right, who are too scared to come forward and say who they are, began monitoring them in 2018 and have captured screenshots of their interactions ever since. Stuff Circuit has been given exclusive access to these dossiers. See, that's a word you use when you want to make something scary. It's a dossier. Though Stuff Circuit and Paula aren't telling us who put these dossiers together, so we can't really figure out what their motivations. Now, these dossiers reveal anti-Muslim sentiment, racism, misogyny and promotion of gun culture. Some posed with firearms. Is it illegal to have a picture with a gun taken or posted online? I don't think it is, Paula. At least, at least two of the men posted photos of their time in the military. What a crime. What a crime. Hold the farm. Let me sit down and recover, Paula. People are posting things about their past military service on social media. What an outrage. Now, a researcher, according to this article, who does not want to be named out of personal security concerns, my ass, because they'd look stupid, has linked them in through photos of gatherings, comments on each other's Islamophobic and racist posts on social media, and video of them protesting at an anti-immigration rally in Auckland's RTS Gear Square while wearing the signature black and yellow Proud Boys polo shirts. Oh, my goodness. Crimes against fashion. Anyway, look, the article blathers on and on and on about the Proud Boys and really doesn't give you any information that such a group actually is organised or exists in New Zealand. A few of the people were quite comfortable, it seems, to talk to Paula Penfold and the rest of the Nazi hunters. And they basically said, oh, we used to get together and drink booze and be laddie. Which, as far as I know, being different than you, Paula, isn't a crime in this country. I suspect, you know what, I suspect that these dossiers and information are coming to Paula Penfold via a group called the Disinformation Project. And you will have heard about them. You will have seen them quoted in lazy legacy media. And they're the people who pop up and tell you there's an upswing in racism online or there's an uptick in misogyny online or there's an uptick in people they don't agree with online. And I've really been trying to find out for months now just who the Disinformation Project are. Here is my initial understanding. 
They are a group of academics whose offices are located in universities, uh, including Victoria and AUT, they, though they do not work for the universities. Very, very curious. Um, Kate Hanna is their leader. She appears to be closely a close friend of the Prime Minister's. I have been asking since June of this year for an interview with Kate Hanna of the Disinformation Project. And her initial um, idea to decline was she didn't feel safe being interviewed by me, which is classic cry bullying. I have never physically injured or had anyone I've interviewed be physically injured as a result of the interview. So I just presumed that Kate Hanna didn't want to answer any questions about the Disinformation Project. We do know that the Disinformation Project uh, appears to be set up at the behest of the Prime Minister and reports to, to the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet and has at least some input into security brief briefings with the NZSIS and New Zealand security officials. And they are used to identify so-called threats to New Zealand security through their trolling of people's social media accounts. So they are an agency of state involved in monitoring and making recommendations to security officials on matters involving New Zealand security. I am presuming, because I can get no answers from them, they are funded by you, the taxpayer, though our research suggests there's also a trust involved. Just who runs that trust and whether or not that trust is overseas funded or funded by, say, a large tech company from Silicon Valley, we simply can't establish because the disinformation project refuses to answer any questions. I suspect the disinformation project is the source of much of Paula Penfold's outrage and the dossiers that they receive, um, which I find very, very strange. But more importantly than that, they are also trying to propagandise our mainstream news media. I was recently made aware of that someone sent me an invitation from the Disinformation Project for a briefing for journalists, a Chatham House Rules, that means an off-the-record briefing, or two of them, to be held next month, one in Auckland and one in Wellington. I was interested to attend as a journalist and to have the platform involved as a media organisation. I then looked and saw who was organising, or the umbrella group for organising the Disinformation Project's secret briefings for journalists. And lo and behold, it was the Ministry of Business, uh, Innovation and Enterprise, a government department. So I contacted them and I said, I'd very much like to attend these seminars, these Chatham House Rules briefings, they seem somewhat embarrassed by my inquiry. But some correspondence flowed, and in the end, I got through to guess who? Kate Hanna, the director of the Disinformation Project. I'm going to share the correspondence that I got from here after the news at 7.30 and introduce you to another organisation which has found the Disinformation Project less than forthcoming about who funds it, who controls it, and what it is does. Um, oh no, look, let, let's do that quickly now. Actually, let's do that quickly now. Kate Hanna, the director of the Disinformation Project, who's already suggested that she feels unsafe being interviewed by, with me by phone, um, writes back and says, oh, look, we'll have a think about it. We might let you come. And then they come back and say, no, no, the platform cannot come to our briefing because the platform isn't um, covered by the BSA. Well, we can't be, Kate. We don't broadcast. We don't have a broadcasting licence. That's why the BSA doesn't cover us. And she said, we also decided you either had to be covered by the BSA or a member of the Media Council of New Zealand. Well, the Media Council of New Zealand is nothing but a self-regulatory body that is designed to protect the business of legacy media. The Media Council does not sit there and protect good journalism. It protects the business of our major publishers. That's why it has a representative from the Real Estate Institute on it who knows nothing about journalism. 
It's a voluntary organisation. And being a member or not being a member of the Media Council does not mean you are not a journalist or a media organisation. So my strong suspicion is that Kate Hanna has made up some criteria for being, uh, for being invited to a government-funded seminar that is specifically designed to exclude me and members of the platform staff. Her emails, which I found outrageous, also suggested that to have me and members of the platform staff at these seminars would pose a physical li uh, risk to the people attending. What a load of bullshit. What a gross insult to make, Kate Hanna. And I'd ask uh, for an apology for that. I have asked, and none has been forthcoming. But I did ask under the Official Information Act for details around these strange criteria they set to exclude a media organisation from a taxpayer-funded seminar. And I've also asked for a list of all the other media companies that are participating just to ensure they meet the criteria as well. What did I get back from Kate Hanna? I got recognition that she had received the Inf Official Information Act request um, but then she said, I'm not sure I'm covered by the Official Information Act. I'm going to check that with the Ombudsman. And that is where things stand at the moment. After the break, we're going to talk to another organisation that is getting the bums rush from the Disinformation Project and why they suspect this organisation that supposedly is about addressing misinformation actually seems extremely invested in spreading it. Okay, let's continue the theme. I have outlined to you this morning three stories that show that most certainly there is a campaign underway, a campaign that seem, aims, seems aimed at importing fear about so-called terrorist groups, mostly male, maybe incels, maybe proud boys. And we have a mainstream media that takes anonymous tip-offs and sources and publishes dossiers and seeks to create drama around these issues. We also have a shady government department, is it, called the Disinformation Project, that is resistant to any real scrutiny and operates, it seems, in a twilight world, though we understand it is involved with security briefings and helping identified so-called threats to the country. So is it just me the disinformation project don't like? Or are they being generally secretive, uh, Kate Hanna, about most of their work? Well, we are joined now uh, by a, representation of, a representative of an organisation you will have heard previously on the platform, the Free Speech Union, which is a group of rather diverse New Zealanders who have got together and said, I think quite rightly, that free speech and freedom of speech is vital in a democracy and that we must be vigilant to ensure that free speech uh, is preserved in this country. Have they been having the same problems with the disinformation project that we have? Let's find out. Jonathan Ayling from the Free Speech Union joins us. Good morning, Jonathan. Nice to have you with us again, mate. Morning, Sean. Good to sit down with you. All right. The disinformation project. Have you come across this lovely bunch of people before? We have indeed. We've, we've actually been reaching out uh, to sit down with them for, I think, about six months now. And we get uh, one thing or another scheduled in, and then before too long, one reason or another comes up to cancel. So uh, we, we haven't had a chance to talk with them yet, which, as a free speech union, uh, we would be very keen to do. Uh, we, we understand the different personalities that are involved in there and, and, and the the positions that they come from, I, I think they have some, some interesting claims and, uh, and perspectives. We okay. would love to be able to dialogue. I'd like to understand more about the people involved there. Tell me what you know about those who staff and run the Disinformation Project. Well, as you say, we, we, the Free Speech Union has, has a very diverse uh, membership and we have an academic advisory council to, uh, to try and uh, promote our work within the universities. We see free speech as being under threat more than ever, uh, anywhere, perhaps. Hey, uh, Jonathan, can uh, I just stop you there? And We're so getting your end a slight crackle. Any reason that could be? Are you? Can we muck around with that with your microphone setting? 
Len- I, um, I, I apologise. Is that any better? Is that any better? No. Just try another. Try a little tweak. Just try a little Sorry, tweak. I'm not sure if that's mine or yours. No, definitely yours. Um, you're not talking on a mic. On a microphone? No, no, just on my computer. Ah, on your computer. That might block. Uh, can we live with that, Kelly? Okay, we can live with it. All right. Um, so, Jonathan, who are these people? Who is Kate Hanna? Who are the other staff members that you know about from the Disinformation Project? Oh, uh, Kate Hanna leads the work there, and, and, and a number of our uh, academics have had uh, conversations with her, also based at University of Auckland. Uh, someone who, uh, you know, is, is working on important work to, to try and understand how disinformation, misinformation come up. And, and you and I agree, Sean, that this is uh, an, an issue we all uh, think has to be addressed. The way to address it, though, is not by shutting down conversations, by censoring it, and by creating, as you're saying, a sense of fear that everyone and their dog around the corner is about to turn into some violent extremist. And I think um, violent extremism, there's another organisation that has uh, recently been established, the, the uh, Centre to Counter Violent Extremism here, Whenua Tau Kura, uh, that, that was set up by the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, another organisation that works in the shadows a bit. And I think you and I share concerns in the way that they operate, not that they exist. We, mm. we need people looking into these questions. We need them to be assessing, uh, you know, uh, assisting and assessing threat levels and contributing to this conversation. The problem is, though, when they become this elite institution that is impenetrable and we don't know what's operating there and these dossiers and, and, um, and memos that get sent out from them end up becoming uh, threats to public conversation that need to be allowed to exist. Jonathan, the Disinformation Project, just get back to them. Who has set them up? Who does fund them? Do we know if their account... I know that they work with the government. MB is organising their secret seminars for them. I know that Kate Hanna tells me she's not paid by a university. So who does pay for the Disinformation Project? Who are they accountable to if they're spending taxpayers' money? Well, th- that's interesting. I, I was under the impression that a uh, portion of their funding was provided by the university. And so if Kate Hanna is specifically claiming that she isn't funded uh, by the university, uh, th- that, that may be a different dynamic for her salary. Uh, but this is the problem, isn't it, Sean? We end up having, uh, you know, these organisations that aren't operating in full transparency and then are operating in a way that others perceive to be uh, P- uh, pushing a certain ideological perspective that isn't open for discussion. I also understand that they provide input to a security threat grouping run under the auspices of the Department and Prime Minister and Cabinet. That would give them quite a powerful role to make claims about New Zealanders that- and make claims that certain groups are terrorists or threats. That's right. And and that's where, uh, you know, a, a inability to engage with those who perhaps disagree with you or come, from, not even disagree, but come from a different perspective is not um, inconvenient for those of us who do want to have the conversation or, or impolite. It actually becomes a, a problem that then shuts down conversations. If these are people that are contributing in, in important ways to a security conversation, their ideological motivations and perspectives within that, their, their, their perspective on free speech and the way it needs to be regulated and the threat that unregulated free speech poses, this then becomes an issue that more people must be drawn into. And that's why, as the free speech union, you know, uh, again, referencing our diversity, we couldn't agree on where to go to lunch, let alone on many of these bigger issues uh, because of the different personalities around the table. But what we do agree in is that we must all be allowed to be part of the conversation, allowed to contribute to these uh, these difficult issues. And where we see these somewhat elitist groups as shut people out and shutting conversations down, that's where we get concerned. All right. Look, the other problem I have is they seem... uh, Kate Hannah's now twice made the claim that talking to the platform or talking to me or my staff would somehow put her or her staff at risk. Uh, I've been doing this a long time. I don't think I've ever physically injured someone or done something that has led to someone being physically injured. I'm sorry, in layman's terms, Jonathan, I call that cry-bullying. Well, uh, that, we, we've had a similar claim from uh, Ms. Hannah. Well, what? That to, to, so, uh, she to said that you're, you're a physical risk to her too. 
you said that to talk to us uh, would exacerbate uh, a threat that she already has. And so, uh, and, and, and uh, at one level, I don't want to minimize that. If uh, legitimate threats have been made against her, that is very serious and that needs to be treated seriously. Mm. However, the Free Speech Union has never been associated in any way no, whatsoever with any threats to anyone. The, the, the free speech is the essence of nonviolence. It's saying that we talk about things, we don't take physical action. And so... Uh, uh, we, um, you know, a again, if Ms. Hannah feels unable to engage with these groups because of physical threat, that would be a problem. That, the threat of violence, would be shutting down free speech, her free speech and, and our right to engage with her then. But uh, I, I do wonder whether... Uh, uh, there is an overemphasis of of what um, danger might mean for her, and it might mean that she come across people that virulently disagree with her, that 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 do not accept the claims or the ideology that that she's coming from. Uh, but actually, that conversation is still legitimate and and not threatening or violence, uh, just because it's it's portrayed that way. Jonathan, have you been invited to these Chatham House briefings by the Disinformation Project next month? No, no, unsurprisingly, Sean, despite being uh, the largest organisation in the country uh, fighting for free speech, despite having uh, a host of very prominent uh, academics that, that work on these very issues, uh, no, unfortunately, we haven't. And, and we are hosting our own AGM next, uh, first week of next month in two weeks, uh, where many of these uh, academics and, and our advisory board will be sharing their perspectives. And so uh, the press are interested in that. They'll be coming along and they'll be interested to see if we see a little bit of a parallel uh, narrative emerge in comparison to the one-sided debate which is being put forward at the moment. All right. Um, would you like to go to these briefings? Um, I'm more than happy to send you the invitation I got or, or the information I got set so you could apply, but they might come up with a list of rules that preclude you. They are suggesting that the platform can't go because we're not members of the Broadcasting Standards Authority and that's because we don't qualify and we're not members of the Voluntary Media Council, which is largely a self-serving um, business lobby group or business self-regulator. Well, that, that's right. And uh, I'm sure if you want, you can create rule structures that, that prove the virtue and morality of one set of operators and the absence of it uh, for, uh, for others, supposedly. And so uh, th this is the problem where we, where we cr start to create um, really what I would consider moralizing perspectives or limitations on who can participate in conversation, who, who, who is legitimate in, in, in um, being part of these conversations or, or whose perspectives are fringe and dangerous and threatening. Uh, I, I think it would be very interesting to partake in these conversations. I don't know if they would necessarily appreciate our contribution. Though. Okay. Fact remains... Even though it's very shady and it doesn't want to talk about details, it appears the disinformation project is publicly funded. Right? Taxpayer funds are being used. Its events are being organised through government departments. Um, and I'm sorry, we just can't get more detail than that out of them. Do you think in a functional democracy the truth and the details about the disinformation project need to be shared with the public and we need to know who this organisation, who I must say appear to have huge sway with legacy media, who this organisation is and who they are accountable to publicly. Oh, Sean, that's very simple. In a functional democracy where uh, a disinformation project, where, where, where certain ideas and perspectives are being challenged as illegitimate, we need to be able to see where those people are coming from and why they're being paid public money and, and how that is contributing to the public dialogue. And again, I'll repeat myself. There is such a thing as disinformation. There is such a thing as misinformation. And I agree with you. We need to be aware of that. Mm. Yep. And so the fact that the disinformation project exists is not a problem. However, we operate in, in such a veil of secrecy that we can't see uh, where they're operating from or why they're engaging in these conversations or the, what they hope to achieve from it. Uh, I wonder how that can advance this conversation and or how it doesn't just promote the sense of grievance and the suspicion that many mm. people have around 
operatives in the space. And that, in that way, I think, uh, as, as many who try and shut down certain forms of speech, I think they're very counterproductive. I think they hurt their own brand by actually failing to just openly discussing the issues that need exposure, fair enough, by actually operating this the secretive way, they, they make people even more hesitant to engage with them and their perspectives even less persuasive. All right. Um, Jonathan, you would have seen over the weekend this campaign, it would seem to me, same journalist names pop up, and I suspect the disinformation project is behind much of it. We now have incels as being the new threat to national security. We have a rather ill-conceived and confusing piece about a group called the Proud Boys here. Are these useful pieces of journalism or are we dealing in a world where we are promoting paranoia? Well, I think we need to assess it from two perspectives. On one level, uh, where the New Zealand Security Information Services, NZSIS, and, and other uh, security services are concerned for threats of violence from certain communities, we need to be very vigilant and, and aware of that. And, and I think, of course, the attack in 2019 showed that New Zealand is not um, exempt from what has infected much of the world as well in, in terms of radical violence. So we must be having that conversation. On the other level, though, are we operating from a sense of ideology that pushes a perspective of the world that is actually up for debate? I'm not saying one side or the other, but but that actually we have to be able to have those conversations. And, and that's where the Free Speech Union gets involved. That's where we just constantly in insist that the most peaceful, prosperous and stable way forward for our nation is for people to be allowed to have their say, to contribute their peace, and then we as a whole nation decide. And I think when we do that, when we allow people to contribute, even if ultimately we don't accept what they say, they feel like they have a part. The problem comes when in individuals or, or even small communities feel entirely excluded that the way that they view the world or the way that they think, as absurd as it may be, is entirely illegitimate to be expressed. At that point, we come into real trouble. And, and you know, I think uh, the, the article on uh, incels, you know what, we, we have seen that this is a credible threat internationally. I'm not concerned with the NZSIS, oh, I think it's very appropriate rather, that the NZSIS look at whether this is a threat in New Zealand. They However, didn't seem that I, concerned I, I, by, by the quotes. They didn't well, seem... Yeah. And, and once they looked into it, once they looked into it, they, they decided that it wasn't, uh, you know, a top of their priority list. But but I think once you, once you work through that article, you see that actually there are many ideological underlying assumptions from those that are uh, writing it and and those that uh, are being sought out for commentary in it that actually show their cards a bit. I want to read this one quote from them uh, in in the article that was from a PhD candidate commenting on it, and it says this crisis narrative that incels have constructs the position of men as in decline and situates themselves as a marginalized group in contemporary society. Despite holding a degree of privilege within society as typically white men and boys, incels perceive themselves as an oppressed marginalized minority in comparison to the mainstream. And I thought that was a really telling uh, uh, quote where they couldn't even just list the way incels perceive it as, as feeling that there's a crisis of masculinity or that they are under threat. They had to just deny that straight out. They think this, but of course it's not true because white men have privilege in our society. That's and Mr. Not, Lindsay that's from right. Victoria University that, who's extensively quoted. Yeah. That, that's correct. And, and so you see, this is the sort of individual that is sought out for comment on this. And that's appropriate. That's his perspective and, and, and he's entirely in, uh, entitled to it. But when... You see the, the comment coming to, to shut down the entire basis of their perspective from the outset. No wonder certain individuals feel that their perspective, their expression, their speech, and their right to contribute to these conversations is illegitimate. And once people feel that their contribution through speech is illegitimate, what do they have left other than more demonstrable forms of action? Yeah. And again, whenever I say that, I'm very careful to say that doesn't justify it at all. I'm just saying... Are we not are we not surprised that we end up in these places sometimes? Yeah. Uh, Jonathan, if Kate Hannah was listening, and I'm sure she'll get a transcript of this or someone will give her one, what would your message to her be, given that she seems absolutely resistant to the idea of anything but a perfectly curated world of people she agrees with talking to her and she runs 
cry bullying to the hills every time someone like you or someone like me tries to engage with her? Uh, uh, my message to Kate Hannah, and, and we've shared this with her along with Professor Joanna Kidman at the at the um, uh, Centre to Counter Extremism, and, and Paula Penfold, who I was in uh, con- uh, correspondence with last week. These sort of individuals were saying, engage with us, talk with us, show us where we're wrong. It, it, we, we believe that speech, almost all speech, should actually be allowed because ultimately it's what moves conversations forward. We perceive your work as shutting conversations down, as privileging certain perspectives, and ultimately this will not help when it comes to violent extremism. This will not help when it comes to disinformation. This will not help when it comes to Paula Penfold's uh, uh, and her conspiracy theories. Uh, we need to be... Well, well hang on, back up the bus there, Jonathan. I've been trying to engage with Paula, who has gone on publicly funded media and slagged me because of my response to fire and fury. Are you saying she also refuses to engage with you? And did I just hear you say you believe she's a conspiracy theorist? No, no, no. I, she doesn't uh, uh, refuse to engage with us. When I said her in a conspiracy theorist, her fire and fury was about the presentation of her perspective of others' conspiracy theories. Right, okay. And so what I'm saying is if you're going to hold a strong position on other people's conspiracy theories, you need to let them speak to them. And and the very point of fire and fury was that they did not let anyone speak to their perspectives. And, and, and oh, so but that's then, the new rule. That, that's the new form of journalism. Apparently, that's what balance and, and ethical journalism means now. And are we surprised that 43 or something percent of Kiwis trust the media and the rest don't? Uh, this is where we see that shutting down speech and privileging certain perspectives actually is a real threat to the ongoing capacity for us to have these conversations and uh, our social cohesion going forward. Mm. Do you reckon Paula Penfold will get an invite to the Disinformation Project's secret briefing? Oh, I, I have no idea uh, who was in, involved in those briefings. I, I wouldn't know. What, what I would say, though, Sean, and you and I had discussed this last week, is uh, here, Finua uh, Toi Kura, the, the Centre to Counter Violence Extremism, is holding their national hui. And uh, the work of the Free Speech Union is directly related to this. And many of our fairly prominent academics would be very well fitted to uh, attend this hui and to contribute a perspective that says that speech and actually the right to contribute in these conversations is one of the best way to counter violent extremism. Unfortunately, we don't tick those boxes. And so we have uh, requested under the OIA a list of those that were invited to that group. And I have no doubt that, again, it will be a certain perspective that has been put forward. And so it's not a surprise. What you put in is what you get out. Uh, when you only put in perspectives that tell us that, that certain ideas are dangerous uh, and certain speech should be silenced, then uh, no wonder we see that come out the other end and this turn into policy that is presented to the government as as what all academics and all experts agree on. If you only ask the people who agree in you, with you, I'm not surprised that's uh, what you hear. Mm. Uh, Jonathan, I do want to ask you one big overarching question which occurred to me during the course of this interview. Prior to, I don't know, the last six or seven years, where has New Zealand or where would you rank New Zealand in terms of our freedom of speech and our tolerance, do we have a history of suppression, of not discussing ideas, or is this a new phenomenon? Certainly, we have a mixed past. Uh, you know, some obvious examples to quickly jump to, uh, giving the woman the right to vote, uh, nu- nuclear, uh, um, you know, uh, use in the Pacific and, and, and opposing that. Uh, the, the Springbok tour, obviously, you know, uh, the... the, the uh, Fenua, well, that's about uh, liberalism, not uh, freedom of speech. That's just about being woke and we've been quite woke. Well, they were all built on the on the right to be able to have your say. Yeah. And so, I, you know, what I always insist is, historically, if we're going to make this a political thing, the right has tried to suppress speech more than the left. However, your point is uh, that the times have changed over the past decade or so, let's say. And I would say definitely uh, New Zealand is experiencing, like much of uh, the English-speaking West, a recession in free speech. And and I would say that, you know, many of our critics have, have been sending us pictures of what's happening in Iran. And they say, this is what opposition to free speech looks like. You guys have no idea what you're talking about. You know, everyone in New Zealand has full free speech. And, uh, and I would say, thank goodness 
things aren't as bad as they are in Iran. If that's what you want us to concede, yes, Sean, I'll give it to you. Uh, free speech is better in New Zealand than it is in Iran. But I want to make a really important distinction, and that's between a cultural perception and legal perception. And, and the cultural perception has to uh, be degraded first before a legal perception will be degraded. And in New Zealand, we still have very strong legal defences to free speech. However, over the past, you say, seven, perhaps, years, we have seen the cultural value of free speech severely degraded in New Zealand. And it is only because of that reason that we're now having conversations about legislation that would also degrade free speech. It's only now that because of the degradation of so uh, of culture of free speech, that a legal degradation can occur. And that's where we see Minister Tenedi's content uh, um, regulation review, hate speech laws, safes, uh, online safety uh, code. These are all pieces of legislation or regulation that now emerge that are actually playing off this uh, recession of free speech culturally. And so mm. our most important work is to try and get out and say actually people having their right to contribute, people having their say is not a threat. And we it's can't do that. And we can't, I can't do that. You can't do that, Jonathan. If the disinformation project cancels us, which is what it is doing. I thank you so much for your time this morning.